Hello and welcome to Murder with Friends, the show where two friends get together and talk about the darker sides of history. I'm your host, Grace Baldridge, and real quick before I toss it over to our guest, I just want to give a shout out to our unofficial sponsor for this week's episode. It's Dayquil and Tea, because your girl is not feeling well. <laughs> but it's season two and we don't take any breaks, so I'm bringing on my good friend Mark Thompson. Welcome to Murder with Friends for the first time. I'm yes. very excited to have you here. I'm excited also. Your, uh, your show is a big part of our house because my girlfriend is is completely hooked, I mean addicted to this show. And well, how did how do we know each other and how might our viewers know you? I'm uh, I'm on the TYT network, I, I sit in on, uh, on the shows on TYT, uh, primarily old school and the main political show. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's where you and I met. Yes. Uh, when you were doing, uh, you were heading the panel there. And uh, I said, that's a fresh faced young gal, I hope I get to know her better. And uh, and and then you came onto my show, which is called The Edge with Mark Thompson. Yeah. And then you got to put the in if you're looking for the show with Mark Thompson because there are a jillion shows called The Edge because it's a crappy name for a podcast. <laughs> but anyway, you can find it wherever podcasts are carried. The Edge with Mark Thompson. So you came on that and you told your great story about driving from LA to Alaska, et cetera, mm -hmm. and a robust friendship was born. Yes, it was. And I approached you about coming onto the show. Well, I, I first of all, I was so flattered that you were watching the show and you reached out to me like, I really like your show. And I was like, oh my gosh, do you? Would you come on? I know that um, was really, I was quite flattered. You do, they're great. One of the things I like about the show, and then we'll get into this case, yeah. but uh, is that you do contemporary uh, stuff like murders in uh, present day or even recent day, last mm -hmm. 30 years. And then what I thought was interesting is going back, you know, centuries to these things that happen where the evidence and the stories are clouded or sketchy. Yeah, and like Elizabeth kind of, Bathory, right. Gilles de Ray, yeah, some You gotta old piece it all ones. together, you know. So. I wish we could do more of those. Um, so maybe let us know in the comment section below what other cases we could look into. Now, you brought a case to me that I had never heard of before, but I have a feeling a lot of you guys will be very familiar with the uh, general inspiration of this case because there's a movie circulating right now called Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri, starring Frances McDormand. It's a, it's a critic's darling, it's probably gonna clean up at the Oscars, but I didn't know that it was actually inspired by true events. So tell us how you heard about this case. Yeah, this is a this is a real story. And the writer of the movie that Grace is talking about is uh, a guy who saw these billboards outside of Vidor, Texas, or mm -hmm. I don't know how you say it, it's V-I-D-O. We've been going back and forth. I have heard it pronounced by people from the South as Vider. <laughs> And that sounds like in a twang, like Vider, Texas. Yeah. It sounds better, but I was saying Vidor before, which sounds way too foreign. So <laughs> That's whatever it is, I'm gonna go with Vider. Okay, so I may, I'll try to say Vider, but I might say Vider because I've been saying Well, that's Vider, good, go back and forth, because then they'll never know which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make some people Vider. happy, yeah. Let's say Vider, Texas for now, Grace. So, uh, uh, so he sees these billboards outside of Vider, Texas, and they refer to, uh, similarly, as in the movie, mm -hmm. the, uh, my daughter was strangled while she was uh, uh, while she was raped. I think he changed the billboard. So there have been uh, a number of different billboards, exactly. not just three stagnant billboards. They have changed over the years. But they're eerily similar to the movie, and mm -hmm. they're also uh, eerily uh, explicit. You know, yeah. when you talk about rape and strangulation at the same time, and it's pretty it's pretty brutal. And so it got him. Uh, this writer, um, he's an Irish writer who's probably gonna win the Academy Award mm. for, an, um, for, for this story, uh, Three Billboards, the, the film this year. It got him thinking and researching and, uh, and he wrote this movie. Well, this movie is though based on a real case whereby a woman was strangled and murdered and uh, the cops, given a lot of evidence, did blow this case in a big yeah, way. Yeah, and as of now, it has never seen a criminal trial. So I, technically, I suppose it's unsolved, although there was a civil trial. Before we get into the details of the murder, let's toss to our first video element. This is the murder of Kathy Page. As the dawn breaks over Vider, Texas on May 14th, 1991, police come across a car accident that appears to have taken the life of the vehicle's driver. The victim is 34-year-old Kathy Page, a local waitress and mother of two young girls. As police examine the body, they realize something far more sinister has taken place. Kathy Page had been murdered, beaten, and strangled to death. The car accident was merely to cover up the killer's crime. Who murdered this small town sweetheart? 
Kathy's father, James Fulton, says he knows who killed his daughter, but the culprit is still at large. The unsolved murder that served as the inspiration for a movie sweeping award season, today on Murder with Friends. So we begin with a really troubling event, which is that the early hours of May 14th, they discover a car wreck, but it's it's very suspicious initially. In this car wreck, they find the body of Kathy Page, um, but pretty quickly investigators know that this was not really how she was killed. Um, do you know some of the details about how she was found? Yes, and uh, it's interesting as I tell you some of these details to keep in mind, these investigators are uh, clearly uh, incompetent on many levels. And then you wonder if it's sort of willful ignorance on another level. And we'll get into the story and you'll see what I mean. But uh, the first thing, what Grace is uh, referring to is the fact that the car has uh, rolled off the side of the road, so it's nose down in this ditch, and yet the body is back against the seat, against mm -hmm. the headrest, which is odd. A normal body would be, after an accident like this, and uh, would be uh, face yeah, into. up against the wheel. Exactly. And her, her feet are also nowhere near either the brakes or the gas. So you would think if you were, if there was a, a terrible car wreck that you would, you know, your feet would be messing with either the gas or the brake and her feet are actually tucked behind her. She's uh, not wearing a seat belt, which is right. also strange. Right, and then, uh, you know, it just completely blows open because she is, uh, upon inspection, she is, the victim of a strangulation, mm -hmm. okay. She's, uh, she, she has these bruises consistent with that. She has no makeup on, which becomes uh, important later because uh, if she was out for the evening and or, or you know going out or whatever, she would have had this makeup and jewelry on, which she had left the house with. Yeah. So these are all things that later on become significant as you piece this all together. Uh, so cops right away figure out, hey, this is uh, staged. Exactly. This is someone's trying to pull something over on and us, and it's not even very elegantly staged. Mm -mm. Well, even the, the what I what I read is that the drink uh, container, so that she had like some soda in the car, they hadn't really even spilled. Which is, I mean, if you're flying into a ditch nose down, of course soda would be spilling, and so it sort of seems like a gentle roll. Um, in, instead of sort of a willful just speeding into a ditch. So investigators are clued in onto what's happening. Now remember her body was discovered around 4.20 a.m. by a paper boy, I remember that because I'm a stoner. And uh, <laughs> then uh, police are on the scene pretty quickly and they are apparently knocking on the door of uh, her husband who she is very recently separated from, Steve Page, by 5.30, 5.45 at the latest. Now, when it comes to the timeline, I find myself very frustrated because no one was keeping records. Um, and so uh, we wouldn't really get this, this concrete timeline until later on, years down the line at the civil trial, but no one was just writing stuff down about, okay, what time, and now it's all, you're, you're forced to remember when do you think that you were at the door. Exactly. But no as one best was, as we can recognize, it was about 5.30, 5.45 a.m., police are knocking on the door of Steve Page. Right, uh, and I, just to interject quickly, not, not only was no one writing anything down, but the photographer who was supposed to photograph the crime scene forgot the film in the camera. Remember, this is film back then, yeah. okay? So uh, you're not even able to get any contemporaneous uh, photos of the scene. They did get them, mm -hmm. but the point is, that's the level of incompetence, and you wonder if this is just, you know. So uh, this is just a guy who got, had to get up early in the morning and didn't have the, and forgot the film. In any case, then they knock on Steve Page's uh, door, as you say, and it's, it's her home where he's uh, spending time watching the kids, isn't that what? Yeah, so yeah. he was asked, uh, she'd asked a couple of other friends to babysit the kids while she was out having you know, a night out with some friends. And they couldn't do it. And they couldn't do it, so she asks Steve Page. Now they've been newly separated. This would have been, I believe, his second or third night by himself from the separation. So this is very brand new, very fresh. Uh, they go to his home, he answers the door in boxers. Um, and they tell him, the police officers tell him that his wife's body has been found and uh, that there's been an accident, a car accident, but they also told him that they believe that the, the scene was staged and that she was strangled uh, and killed elsewhere. And stop right there because that's a weird thing. Normally when you uh, interrogate or question the prime suspect, who's usually the spouse, mm -hmm. as you know here from right. with friends, the 
Uh, the details of the murder are often not revealed, at least immediately, because you're trying to gain inconsistencies in the story or, or some kind of narrative from the person you're speaking with. Well, immediately when you are talking to a person of interest, it becomes a bit like a chess match, and you don't want to give away what your next move is going to be. And so I, I've heard a number of different explanations on why they came to him with this information outright. Now, some people are saying that's just incompetence. They just didn't know any better. Now, some people were saying that they told him this information because they were hoping for an excited utterance. Right. An excited utterance is uh, admissible um, yeah. with the exception of like the, if the hears, so it, it's- It's okay. an exception of the hears. Yes, rule. that's, what it, yeah, that's like, what it is. It's yeah. like, I'm dating a lawyer, how do I not know this? But it is, <laughs> an excited utterance is admissible in court, is an exception to the hearsay ruling, which means that if, if they had told him this information and he had exclaimed back to them, oh, I can't believe what I've done, that would have been admissible. It would have been a sign of his guilt because of all the emotion and the tension, the passion of the moment. But they didn't get that reaction from Steve Page. In fact, uh, he, he was characterized as hysterical, but there were no tears, and much would be made of that at the civil he trial. Cried, he cried. Uh, then he uh, uh, fell back on the couch. Then he uh, then he was okay. Uh, yeah. but, but it is true, and and uh, it's interesting. It was often noted there were no tears because they had a flashlight. The cops mm -hmm. and they said when we flashed the we just we had a flashlight there, and there were no there were no tears. He was crying without tears uh, because. Early on in this case, as you uh, as, as it's revealed and as the accusations begin to fly back and forth, it's suggested that the cops might have been uh, his pals or covering for him or not really investigating. They seem to sort of like uh, just be walking through the motions on yeah. some level. And if that's true, then they wouldn't have revealed, I, I think, the um, uh, the fact that there were no tears because that would seem to be damning. So uh, again, just as I was kind of peeling back the onion on this, I was trying to figure it out. I'm, I'm thinking, I think, I just think that they were incompetent. I think they were. Yeah, I also was sort of hesitant when I when I hear that much is made of him not crying. Part of me is like, well, you never know how someone's gonna react to a trauma. Sometimes people don't cry. I mean, there's plenty of things that Steve Page will go on to do that I find suspicious, but I actually didn't feel that that was as troubling as some other people felt from the the not crying. You know, my, my brother is the most emotional person I know and he never cries, but he's so, he'll he'll feel that sadness in other in other ways. Well, uh, yeah, there's so many, uh, I don't mean to ascribe too much significance to the not crying, mm -hmm. but they do talk about how hysterical he is. So yeah. if you're hysterical and you're going through all the motions of crying, but there are no tears coming out, that's when that becomes uh, conspicuous. Not the fact that he didn't cry. But he does so many other things, and there's so much more evidence than you don't need to even have the tears or right. Let's of say, them. yeah, let's That's just put that it. aside. Yeah. There's so much more to this story. So police officers uh, question him, but what they don't do is secure the premises or obtain a search warrant. Um, now, but that's insane. Well, some some people would say, well, it's late at night. They, you know, what are they going to wake up a judge, get a search warrant? Well, then the next morning, when it's you know 7 a.m., they go back to question him again. The and next morning, 7 a.m. is just two hours later. I know. And they still, no search warrant. In fact, they wouldn't obtain a search warrant until years later I mean, uh, following and, the initial investigation. And he washes down the crime scene, which uh, yeah, as yeah. we learn. We're gonna get into that. Yeah, We're gonna I get mean, into that in part two along okay. the suspicious activity and the suspects surrounding this case. Um, but, what, but basically just to carry out this timeline, uh, the investigator, they, they come back at the 7 a.m., no search warrant, haven't secured the premises. Um, and then there's something that's strange that again, you can't place because they never subpoenaed the call records even at the civil trial was that after, it, it seems as though after police left his place, Steve Page made a couple of calls, one to Kathy's family to tell them that something awful had happened and that perhaps she'd broken her neck in an accident, which is weird because he knew by that time, again, we I, I wish we had call records so we could see exactly, but he knew by that time that it wasn't that her neck was broken in a car accident, she had been murdered. Um, and then he also calls a friend of hers named Charlotte uh, and asks where she is. This, um, there's gonna be a lot of contention surrounding this call specifically, because initially he said that he called this friend at 3.30, then he changed the story to 4.30, and then she has never faltered from, I received a call from Steve Page between 5.30 and 6 a.m. on on the, the night, I guess the morning of the murder, asking where uh, Kathy was. Now, it, to me, that seems like he's trying to establish some sort of 
an alibi, that he was worried about his wife and trying to put out some calls. Maybe he wasn't thinking about uh, call records and how that could come back to him. There's a lot of guilty stuff that happens, but what's important to remember is that no one is behind bars for this murder, but there are a lot of suspicions surrounding the people involved in this case. When we come back in part two, we're gonna break down the suspects and more details surrounding the case for you.